In my Structural Engineering Made Simple series, today I talk about design of reinforced concrete beams for torsion. Please take a moment and read the disclaimer at the bottom of this slide before we continue. Torsion moments usually occur in spandrel beams or in girders that support other structural members such as slabs and beams, either on one side or at both sides, but with unequal load distribution and geometry. Generally, when there is a torsional resistance at the joint, a torsional moment will develop. Therefore, if a girder provides support for a beam on one side only, and the connection is considered as a single support, no torsional moment is expected to develop. The distributed bending moment M in the slab in figure below, as you can see in here, is resisted by a torsional action of the spandrel beam. Therefore, the beam will need to be designed for a torsional moment, which sometimes is called the torque, with a resistance of phi multiplied by T sub N, where phi is the resistance reduction factor for torsion and Tn is the nominal torsional capacity of a section. This lecture is number 18 in my series on a structural engineering made simple. It covers the design procedure for torsion in reinforced concrete beams. Some of the materials presented here requires prior knowledge in reinforced concrete beam design in bending and shear. Therefore, I recommend watching lecture number seven and eight of my YouTube series on structural engineering made simple. The design for torsion for a beam is done for a factored applied torque TU, which has the same unit as that of a bending moment, such as foot pounds, for example. However, this torque is often accompanied by an applied bending moment MU and shear VU at the same section where the design for TU is done. These are the pertinent references used in the preparation of this video. Structure analysis. ACI offers two alternatives for analysis and design of members subject to torsion and these are as follows. Alternative one, if the system is statically indeterminate, such as nearly all frames, we can neglect torsional stiffness and design the member for a minimum specified torsion moment T sub U, as will be explained later. In this case, we allow the members to crack. Notice that this alternative can only be used when the system is indeterminate. Alternative two, estimate the torsional stiffness using any reasonable method and conduct a detailed structure analysis computing the design torsional moment is of U. For, the, for this alternative, TU can be computed using software capable of a three-dimensional frame analysis. In such an analysis, a reasonable assumption of torsional stiffness for members must be made. Note that for a beam that is integral with a slab, a portion of the slab also contributes to beam stiffness. This means the beam will be considered as having a single flange or double flange like a T-section. Design considerations. Let's review design considerations for torsional design in beams. In general, a structural member must have adequate nominal strength MN, VN, and TN to satisfy the following equations. Please notice that we are assuming there are no axial force in the member. If there is an axial load in the member, there would be a fourth equation added to the list. 
In these equations, on the left side, you will see, for example, something like MU, which is the applied load action, such as bending moment. On the left, you see phi MN. Phi is a resistance reduction factor, and MN is a nominal bending resistance. The resistance reduction factor for bending is usually around 0 0.9 or less. And for the shear and for torsion is equal to 0 0.75. The critical location for torsion is at the distance D from face of the support. However, if there is a concentrated torsional moment applied between this section and the face of the support, the critical section will be at the face of the support. And the parameter D that we introduce here is the effective depth of cross section, which is the distance of the center of tension steel to the extreme compression fiber of cross section. Reinforcement required in torsion design is in the form of longitudinal bars in addition to those needed for bending and closed loop stirrups. The longitudinal reinforcement is distributed around the perimeter of the cross section per ACI prescribed rules as described later in this video. The closed loop stirrups for torsion can be combined with those required for shear, but in any case, the most severe requirements on a stirrup spacing should be used. For the combination of shear and torsion, the section must be checked to make sure it's large enough to carry this combination effect. The design of reinforcement, however, is always done separately for shear and torsion. For design of reinforcement for torsion, a portion of the slab on either or both sides can be used only if the closed loop stirrups extend into the portion of the slab. The combined, in other words, interactive effect of flexural moment and torsional moment need not be considered. Any extra reinforcement used in flexural design may be used for longitudinal reinforcement needed for torsion. The longitudinal reinforcement for torsion must be enclosed by stirrups. There must be one bar at each corner of the section. The bars must be distributed uniformly around the perimeter of the inner side of the stirrups and the clear spacing between longitudinal bars needed for torsion cannot exceed 12 inches. Now, practically, this latter condition implies that longitudinal bars may have to be placed in mid-height of the beam section as well. Longitudinal torsional reinforcement needs to extend for a distance equal to BT plus D beyond the point where the calculations show the applied torque is less than the threshold value T sub TH. B sub T and T sub TH or explained later. Likewise, closed loop stirrups can be terminated at the location BT plus D beyond the point where the calculation shows design for torsion is no longer needed. And the parameter B sub T is the width of the section resisting torsional moment. The diameter of longitudinal torsion bars has to be larger than 0.42 times S, but not less than 3 eighths of an inch. S is the closed loop stirrup spacing. For hollow sections, as shown in here, the center of closed loop stirrup to the inside face wall of the hollow section has to be at least equal to 0.5 A0H divided by pH. The definitions of the area A0H and the perimeter pH are provided later. As you can see here, this thickness is taken as 0, A times 0, A, sorry, A0H divided by pH. 
As we will see later, a0 h divided by pH is taken as a thickness of the wall of hollow section. So the above requirement practically means the closed loop syrup should be in the outer half of the wall, as you can see in here. This distance shows the distance between the inner side of the wall and the location of the closed loop syrup which has to be larger than 0.5 A0H over pH. So the syrup is actually closer to the outer face of the uh, cross section. Cracking torque of a plain concrete section. This is a torsional moment which is shown with T sub CR and is equal to the torque that causes cracking of the section. It is obtained by assuming the torque section behaves like a thin wall tube with core concrete ineffective, setting the tension developed as a result of shear stresses equal to the tensile stress causing concrete to crack, which is 4 square root over prime sub C. The thin tube is assumed to have a thickness proportional to the area ACP divided by the perimeter PCP of the section. The T sub CR equation therefore is obtained based on the uh, thin tube theory as 4 square root of prime sub C, A sub CP squared divided by PCP. The threshold torque we talked about before is a quarter of this value. The threshold value for the torque or torsional moment, as sometimes we call it, is therefore equal to square root of prime sub C, A sub CP squared divided by P sub CP. Therefore, after computing T sub U, if you found out it is less than 5 multiplied by this threshold value, we don't need to design for torsion. Of course, if it is larger than this, then we have to design for torsion. That means we have to design for longitudinal and transverse, in other words, a stirrups reinforcement. In here, we talk about how to compute ACP and PCP. They depend on the type of cross section. In this illustration, you see a rectangular cross-section. For this one, ACP is simply the area of the shaded portion, which is the area of the cross-section. PCP is a perimeter. If you have a section that supports a slab, a slab such as this case, and here is a slab, we draw a line from this point at 45 degree angle until we intersect the flange. And that would tell us what portion of the slab should be used. However, if the corresponding distance B1, which now would be equal to HW, is larger than four times the thickness, we use four times the thickness. In a simplified format, the dimension B1 is the minimum of HW and four times T. The shaded area, as you can see here now, is therefore used for computing A sub CP and P sub CP. Likewise, in a T section, when you have slabs on both sides, you do the same rule and you determine the dimension B1. And then the shaded area, as shown in here, is the one used in the computation of ACP and PCP. And these are the equation for the T section. These are the equation for what we call the L section. Torsional resistance of a reinforced section. As indicated, torsional reinforcement is in the form of longitudinal and transverse reinforcement, or what we call closed loop stirrups. In computing the torsional resistance of a section, only the resistance provided by steel is considered. Although the concrete itself contributes some to the torsion, we don't consider that. The equations for the resistance are obtained based on the thin tube analogy, which happens at the start of crack development, and space thrust analogy, which happens at the extreme case when most of the concrete is gone. Let's look at these two analogies. 
The thin tube analogy is shown in here. As you can see the figure to the left, the concrete is cracked with the cracking angles around 45 degrees. There is a tension force in the longitudinal bars compensated by compression force on block of concrete. The core concrete is assumed gone. And as you can see in the cross section in here, we have the analogy of a thin a tube theory with shear flow shown in the cross section. And as a result of the shear flow, we can write equations relating the applied torque to the shear flow. As the applied torque is increased, the thin wall is lost. The steel bars and stirrups are intact. They continue carrying the load. However, there are some blocks of surviving concrete in between the stirrups acting as the diagonal compression members of the space truss. We have tension forces inside the bars. As we'll see later on, they are in equilibrium with compression forces in concrete. And then we have the shear forces in the stirrups. Again, you see the pattern of a shear flow. The things is going around like that. Also, please pay attention to the two dimensions we have shown in here, x0 and y0. Those are dimensions showing the center of a syrup from one side to the other, in other words, from one leg to the other. And usually the smaller dimension is shown with x. Here is a 2D view looking at one, one of the four faces of the structural member. N2 is the tension force in bars, and V2 is a shear force, and the resultant of the two is a force D2, which is in balance with the compression in the concrete blocks. The angle theta is 45 degrees, as we'll see later. There are several parameters used in here. Please pay attention to the dimension Y0 we talked before, and also notice that the spacing of the stirrup is shown with S. At the extreme conditions, when the steel has yielded, the force in the stirrup is 80 divided by FIV, where 80 is the area of the closed loop stirrup. So if you have a number 3, that would be 0 0.11 square inch. FYV and FYL are the yield resistances of a stirrup and the longitudinal bar, and usually they are the same. The total tension force in the longitudinal bars is AL multiplied by FYL, where AL is the area of the longitudinal bar. Therefore, the force N2 that we have shown in here is actually a quarter of the total tension force because there are four faces and each of those is represented by one of those N forces. Torsion are the strength of a reinforced concrete section and design equations. Before we go over the equation for torsion are the strength of a reinforced concrete section, let's introduce two additional cross-section parameters that we introduced before. These are A0H, which is an area, and PH, which is a parameter, rather perimeter. So here we have shown uh, a section with a slab. However, notice that the stirrups are only used within the rectangular area, in other words, within the web. The two dimensions x0 and y0 are shown, goes from the center of one stirrup to the center of the other leg of the stirrup. And then you notice that uh, they correspond to x and y, and as I said, x is usually the smaller dimension. And also notice that the shaded area is only shown in here where the stirrup is. So with this configuration, we can compute the A0H, which is simply product of x0 and y0, and the perimeter pH. If the protection cover is one and a half inches from each side, we can easily find x0 and y0. So x0 is x minus three inches plus the diameter of this stirrup. 
x is one half of diameter from one side, one half from the other. That's why we get the ds in the equation. However, if we have a situations like this figure shown down in here, a portion of the slab is contributing, and you notice that the stirrup has practically gone inside the slab as well. In that case, when we compute A0, H, and pH, we really consider the entire area where the stirrup is located. So please be careful when you're computing A0, H, and pH. The case of this L section is different from the case of this L section that doesn't have stirrups extended into the slab. The nominal torsional resistance is obtained by using the shear flow in the thin tube and equilibrium of all forces in the space thrust analogy. And the final equation is equal to the following, that Tn is equal to 2A0 times ATFYV over S times cotangent theta. As I said, angle theta is 45 degrees and A0 is taken as 85% of A0H. Therefore, the design requirement can be uh, provided in here uh, in the form of uh, several steps. First of all, you'll notice that the required strength would be Tu divided by phi. And therefore, if you plug this value for Tn and solve the equation for At over S, we find this equation for the required value of At over S which is fairly straightforward. Also, since the axial load in longitudinal bars and shear forces are related, it can be shown that the required area of steel is equal to this equation, with the theta being equal to 45 degrees, cotangent theta is equal to 1, and if Fyv is the same as Fyl, the required uh, area for the longitudinal steels becomes very, very simple. is AT over S multiplied by pH. There is also an important conclusion here. Uh, since pH is practically the perimeter of the closed loop stirrup, the equation we just found could be rearranged and written in this form. If we look at this equation closely, you notice that it says the volume of the longitudinal bar over the length S which is the spacing of the stirrup, is the same as the volume of the stirrup in one loop. The ACI requires combining shear and torsion when designing the stirrups and checking the adequacy, in other words, the size of the section against the maximum absolute applied shear stress, which is phi 10 square root of prime sub c, as would be explained later. We realize that in a shear stirrup, that means a stirrup that is needed for shear force, the area is multiplied by the number of vertical legs of the stirrup. However, in torsion stirrups, in other words, the stirrups that are needed for torsion, the area is only the area of the bar. It is not multiplied by the number of legs. So if you have a number three bar, for this purpose, the cross-sectional area is simply 0 0.11. This is illustrated in the following figure. If you look at the figure to the left, as you can see in here, you see the shear forces in the same direction, upward, and therefore a crack that would intersect the stirrup would have two bars resisting it. That's why the area is multiplied by two. We get 0 0.22 if it is a number three. However, in the case of a torsion, you notice that we have the shear in a shear flow manner going in one direction like that, and therefore, the resistance is only with one area, not multiplied by two. So when we are combining the two, we have to be careful that AV over S, which is the required 
value for shear is added to two times the required value for torsion. Please be careful that the, what we call the required AVT over S is still uses 0.22 in the calculations. In checking the adequacy of the section, the combined shear from torque, in other words, the torsional moment, and from the shear cannot exceed the absolute maximum shear stress allowed. Let's examine this more carefully. If you recall from the shear design, we use the simplified equation. The shear resistance provided by concrete itself is phi 2 square root of prime sub CBD. And when we put reinforcement, the absolute value of the highest value that we can use for V sub S, which is the shear resistance by steel, is phi 8 square root of prime sub CBD. When we combine these two, then we have phi 10 square root of prime sub CBD. However, when we write this in terms of the shear stress, then we have an upper bound for the shear stress. We cannot have a shear stress in the section exceeding phi 10 square root of prime sub C. In practice, we use this requirement first to make sure the section is large enough for the combination of shear and torsion. If this condition is not satisfied, then we must increase the size of the section and use a larger section. Let's look at the applied total uh, shear stress, which is coming from the shear force V sub U, and that is VU divided by BD. And let's look at the shear stress that comes from a torque, if we call that one VTU. Using the thin tube theory, that stress is TUPH divided by 1.7A0H squared. Now the next question is how do we combine those? And if our section is a hollow section, then we can simply add the two values as it is demonstrated in here. When you look at the figure to the left, Again, you see the familiar uh, situation with the shear always upward. However, when you look at the figure to the right, you notice that the familiar case of shear going around. So uh, you need to add the maximum shear from both cases, and that is happening over here. So this value is added to this simply. That gives you the maximum value. Therefore, the ACI suggests that we simply add the two and make sure this value is smaller than phi 10 square root of prime sub C. Now let's look at the solid section. For a solid section, the situation is a bit more complicated and the ACI requires that we use the square root of some of the squares of the two stresses and make sure it is less than this. Let's examine this graphically again. For the shear, as you can see on the figure to the left, again, we have the familiar face of all the shears going in upward. And however, for the torsion, we have them going around. So the question is, therefore, how do we find the maximum? And the best estimate for the maximum is when we use the square root of some of these squares. If in any case, the total stress exceeds 10 square root of prime sub C multiplied by phi. Remember that you need to increase the size of the cross section. Let's look at requirements for shear reinforcement. The first requirement is a minimum amount of reinforcement, which is very similar to the minimum amount for shear design, except that we need to combine the two. Also, we need to make sure that talking about torsion alone, the torsion reinforcement is at least equal to half of this value. So it's 25 BW over FIV. We also have requirements on the spacing for torsion 
the spacing of stirrups can be larger than pH over 8 and uh, cannot be larger than 12. By the way, the BW that appears in the equation is the width of the verb, and if it is a rectangular section, that's exactly the same as B. Don't forget that we also have requirements for a spacing for the stirrups in the case of shear design, and those are D over 2 and 24 inches. So actually, we need to check the spacing against four values, two in here, two in here, and if you uh, would like to know more about these requirements on D over 2 and 24 inches, please see lesson number 8 of my YouTube series. Now let's look at the longitudinal steel. The area of longitudinal steel, AL, needs to be distributed around the perimeter of the cross section with a spacing less than 12 inches, as we discussed before. Any extra steel used for bending can be used towards the AL requirement, as we're going to demonstrate in an example. There is also a minimum value for longitudinal steel, which is this equation. However, make sure that when you are putting AT over S in the equation, if it is smaller than 25 BW over FI, make sure to use this value instead in the equation. From my experience, this equation sometimes turns out to be negative. So that means actually the L minimum would be zero. So I added this portion to the equation and that is my addition. It is not in the ACI, but that's my experience to avoid this one, you know, to show it negative. So when it's negative, simply use zero. Let's look at an example. In this example, we see a cross-section rectangular designed for top steel of three number eight, bottom steel of two number five. The main tension steel is at the top because usually sections that are critical for torsion are towards the end of the section where the bending moment is negative. The two number five are pretty much nominal steel. So. The total area that needed by calculation, this problem says was 2.1 square inches. However, they use three number eight. Therefore, the area that is used is 2.37. So we have about 0 0.27 extra steel in there. We can use for torsion. At the bottom, this 0 0.62, which is two number five, is totally extra, could be used for torsion. Notice that if I go ahead and compute the a distance from the center of this stirrup to the center of this portion of this stirrup, that is certainly larger than 12 inches, which is an indication that uh, the spacing between the bars, the clear spacing between the bars would be larger than 12 inches. So why am I saying it? And you're going to see it later uh, that we may have to put some additional bars at the mid height to bring that spacing down. Calculations have shown that the area of a steel needed for torsion in the longitudinal direction is 1.45 square inch. So keep that in mind. Now, if we divide this by two and say, okay, we'll put one segment at the top, one segment at the bottom, you will have that problem that I told you about because this would be larger than 12. So certainly we can't simply use that required steel in two layers. If we divide it by three and use one third of at the middle, one third at the top, one third at the bottom, then we fix the problem. Now let's look at the required steel at the top. For torsion and bending, we have the 2.58 total steel needed. Now you get one third for the torsion, 2.1 from bending, and what we have available is only 2.37, which is not enough. So we're going to change the design to two number nine and one number seven. That gives us 2.6. So we have fixed the problem for the top steel. For the bottom steel, uh, 1.45 divided by 3, we need 0 0.48, we have 0 0.62, we are fine. And uh, for the middle, also we use 2 number 5. We can use 2 number 4 because 2 number 4 would be 0 0.4, so 2 number 5 would be adequate. Therefore, this is our final design. At the top, we change the 
design so we are using uh, this combination of bars you notice that now we have the middle is still added and the bottom is still we keep it intact so that is the design for torsion let's look at this example now in this one we have a torque that has been computed as 72.5 at D from face of a support. At the same section, we have a very large shear force of 102.6. You notice that a portion of the slab is contributing to the cross section. And uh, we have therefore this the shaded area, and this is only for computing the MU value, the cracking value, all right? And you notice that we, did that 45 degree line and then we hit this slab over here however that b1 distance which is equal to 26 is larger than four times the thickness of this slab therefore we are using 24 inches so uh, let's uh, talk about other parameters given the top reinforcement for negative moment was 2 number 11 plus 4 number 10, so 8.2 we are using square inches. The calculations have shown that only 7.91 square inch was needed. Nominal C2 number 5 are used at the bottom. We didn't need them to simply use them. And we are using number 4 bars for stirrups. And it is in the web only according to the problem. So we'll see the significance of this information later. The diameter of number four is 0 0.5 and area is 0 0.2 square inches. And these are the material properties. For all steel, we are using 60,000 PSI FY. Now A sub CP and P sub CP are based on the shaded area, regardless of where the stirrups are. And that's for the computation of MCR. So we plug those values in the equation and we get uh, MCR or sometimes we call it TCR and we here we call it TCR as 85.25 foot kips. A quarter of that is the threshold value. Don't forget, we need to multiply by phi. So that is our threshold value factored. And of course, our TU that we saw previous slide is larger than 16. That means we must design for torsion, design longitudinal and uh, stirrups. First, we find out whether our section is large enough for the combination of effect of torsion and shear, as I mentioned before. So here is our section. We will see uh, that the stirrup is only in the web area and therefore uh, we compute x0 and y0 and when we compute a0h and ph only we consider this area because the stirrup is not extended into the slab now we have the equation for combination of the two uh, shear stresses and we use a square root of sum of the squares because it's a solid section make sure that you use consistent units in these equations use pounds and inches and the left side of the equation tells us that the total stress is 271.3 psi the right side of the equation tells us that the value is 474.3 so certainly we are complying with this requirement and that means our section is large enough we don't have to change it and now let's look at this stirrup design and we do this separately for torsion and shear again for shear please look at lesson eight if you are not familiar how to design the stirrups for shear forces so let's do it for torsion first remember required 80 over s from the equation I gave you. So we simply plug numbers. You notice that despite the two analogies we talked about, the design process is very simple. 0 0.0242 is how much AT over S we need. Now, we always do these things based on AT over S. We don't decide on the spacing at this stage. Now let's look at the zero for the shear force. And first let's compute how much shear capacity the concrete itself provides. 
the simple equation is 2 square root of prime sub CBD. And uh, in here, the D is given by the problem as 29 and a half inches. And uh, you can actually go ahead and compute yourself by knowing the size of the stirrup and size of the bars. You can compute that. Is, uh, the value is 74,630. And certainly, uh, the required value for a strength is much larger than that. So the difference between the two is how much the stirrup needs provide. And we call that from VS. So the next step is to plug it in the equation for required AV over S, which is VS over FID. And we have this much value needed for the, uh, what we call transfer reinforcement for shear. We combine the two, remember, one plus two times the other one. So that is how much total we need. All right. Now let's check first with the minimum. The AVTS minimum is 50 multiplied by BW divided by FIV. So this is a minimum. Certainly we're using much larger, so we don't have to worry about the minimum. And uh, also we need to check the requirement for the torsion alone. So the requirement for torsion is 25 BW F5, which is this much. And remember that the value was 0 0.0242, which is larger than this. So we're okay on that as well. But the AVT is 2 times 0 0.2. That's what we use in our equation based on the combination I told you about. So now we are ready. AVT over S, therefore, is 0 0.4 over S. Set it equal to this value, and you get the spacing needed as 4.79. But well, let's check it now against all those requirements for the spacing. We got two spacing requirements for torsion. One is 11.3, the other 12, so we're okay. And there are two requirements for shear, D over 2 and 24, so we're fine. So what's the final conclusion? Let's use number 4 is stirrups at 4 and 3 quarters of inches on centers. Let's look at longitudinal steel, and the equation I gave you is related to AT over S, but this is AT over S, not the total. So we need 2.18 square inches of cross-sectional area for longitudinal bars. Let's immediately check it against the minimum. Now plug numbers in here, but pay attention that this value over here cannot be smaller than 25 BW of 5, but we have it at 0 0.0242, so we are okay. So plug this value in here. And uh, once you plug the value, you come up with a minimum at 0 0.45 square inches. So we're fine because we are using 2.18. And uh, if we use, uh, Certainly, I can use two segments because the spacing would be larger than 12. If I use three segments, still the spacing would be larger than 12. So we have to divide this into four segments. And if you use it in four segments, the clear spacing between bars would be now less than 12. So use a quarter at the top. So we need 0 0.55 square inches. For bending, we need a 7.91. So if I add the two, I need 8.46. And uh, what am I using? 2 number 11 for number 10 is 8.2. So it's not adequate. You need to modify that. So we change it to 4 number 11 and 2 number 10. And that gives me area of a seal as 8.78. So now it's okay. For the bottom, we need a quarter of 2.18. And we are using 0 0.62. So we are fine. And then we have two layers of middle steel. For each one, let's use two number five because we only need 0 0.55 for each. And with that, this would be the detail of what we are using right now. Heavier steel, of course, is constant at the top because there is a negative bending moment that requires a lot of steel. You notice that now we got these two additional middle layers and the bottom steel. 
Please note that in the foregoing computations, we use the simple equations that are applicable to most cases. There are, however, other requirements for torsion for special conditions that will need to be considered. For example, for members under an axial compression, the equation for T sub CR will need to be adjusted. And if you have a applied tension, there would be also further adjustment. So please make sure to go through the ACI for a complete review of all requirements. Thank you for watching this video.